Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Um, today we're very fortunate to have uh, a very esteemed speaker who will be speaking to us about um, Occupied Kashmir. We will um, introduce him in a second, but before we start uh, the main talk, we're going to have a recitation of Quran by Amara Sarya. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ata Amrullahi Fala Tasta'ajilu Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Amma Yushriku ينزل الملائكة بالروح من أمره على من يشاء من عباده على من يشاء من عباده أن أنذروا أنه لا إله إلا أنه لا إله إلا أنا فاتقون خلق السماوات والأرض بالحق تعالى عما يشركون خلق الإنسان من نطفة فإذا هو خصيم مبين وَالْأَنْعَامُ خَلَقَهَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا دِفْءٌ وَمَنَافِعُ وَمِنْهَا تَأْكُلُونَ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا جَمَالٌ حِينَ تُرِيحُونَ وَحِينَ تَسْرَحُونَ وَتَحْمِلُ أَثْرَ قَالَكُمْ إِلَى بَلَدٍ لَمْ تَكُونُوا بَالِغِيهِ إِلَّا بِشِقِّ الْأَنْفُسِ إِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَرَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ والخيل والبغال والحمير لتركبوها وزينة وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ قَصْدُ السَّبِيلِ وَمِنْهَا جَائِرُ وَلَوْ شَاءَ لَهَدَاكُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Thank you very much for that beautiful recitation. We're now very fortunate to have uh, Muhammad Shafiq, who is speaking to us about occupied Kashmir, history, human rights violations, and the future. Um, Muhammad is the chief executive and founding member of the Ramadan Foundation, which is one of the UK's leading youth, Muslim youth organizations based in Manchester. Uh, married with two daughters, Muhammad is a second generation British Muslim, born in 1979 to parents from Pakistan, and he attended school and was brought up in, in Rochdale. Um, let's welcome you to Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Uh, first of all, Miktar, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and uh, particularly uh, tribute to you for all the work that you are doing uh, for the community of the Muslim, um, of the British Muslims here and around the world. And uh, your work is absolutely vital and I'm really proud to call you a friend and an ally and a colleague um, and above all as a brother. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity. What I want to try to do is talk to you uh, very much about the issue of Kashmir. Now, sometimes we forget the history and the reality of how we got to where we are today. So I will go through my presentation. And if there are any questions or comments, I'll be happy to uh, take them at the end of the presentation. Um, so first of all, uh, that's a bit biography, as uh, Mikdad said, um, slightly... Um, uh, I, so I'm, I, I've been involved in the Ramadan Foundation since day one, which was 2005, very active, as you know, on the British media and around the world, uh, and a presenter on British Muslim TV, um, and before that on my channel and uh, BBC and 
uh, Iqara in the Middle East as well. So lots of activity in the media, um, but also very active in the community. Um, so this is just literally to give you an idea of some of the things uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, how it started, uh, the facts of the history, uh, where we are in terms of the Labour Party and the British political parties, uh, and uh, looking at Prime Minister Modi and his RSS ideology. Okay, so when did this start? So if you look at the image uh, on the left of your screen, you'll see uh, Lord Ma Louis Mountbatten, uh, who's the last Viceroy of India. At the time, uh, the British Empire uh, was still occupying uh, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, to his left, you've got Nehru, and to his right, you've got Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Um, and they are just discussing that photograph and that meeting was how they were going to divide up the territory into the two states. And if you look at the issue of Kashmir, you can see here, uh, and the picture on here is the actual land of Kashmir. Uh, obviously here, as you can see, it's uh, Pakistan controlled, um, Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Balistan, which is a separate entity, but also gets its security from Pakistan. You've got the Indian administered uh, area, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and you've got these bits here, which are uh, occupied and controlled by the Chinese. So the dispute started between India and Pakistan uh, before the independence uh, in 1947. At the time of independence, uh, there were various princely states and Jammu and Kashmir was one of them. It had a majority Muslim population but was governed by the Maharaja Hari Singh. And to avert pressure to join either new nation, as the planning was being done to create these two new states, India and Pakistan, um, the Maharaja signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan so that they could use that opportunity to continue to trade uh, between the borders and the, and the two entities. India didn't sign that trade uh, decision and agreement with the princely state. But at the time of partition, when you saw the violence on both sides, you saw killing uh, and the mass migration. At that point, the Maharaja reached out to the Indian uh, government and the Indian uh, army and wanted them to uh, provide security and protection uh, for the uh, Jammu and Kashmir. And what happened there was that uh, India said to the Maharaja, if you want our protection, you're gonna have to see it and come over under our control, which he ultimately then did. So how much does India actually occupy of Kashmir? India controls around 48% of the land of Kashmir. The area includes Jammu, the Kashmir Valley, and most of uh, Latkan and the Saishan glaciers. And actually of the Indian population in Kashmir, uh, of both part, of three parts, it has 70% 70, 70 of the population uh, in Indian occupied Kashmir. So what about Pakistan and China? Pakistan controls about 35%, three areas, uh, as we saw on the map and the previous slide, uh, called Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Balistan, is made up of the northern and western portions of the region. And the capital of Azad Kashmir is Muzaffarabad. Now they have their own parliament, the prime minister and president and government and, and judicial system. But in terms of security, Pakistan uh, provides that security and very much linked in uh, under the umbrella of Pakistan. And then finally, you've got China controls 17%, and the area particularly is called Aksai Chin uh, in the northernmost uh, part of the region. And you might have heard about this in the news in the past few weeks, uh, these military skirmishes between the two groups, the Chinese and the Indians. Uh, well, that's that area um, of, of conflict, which both sides claim that they have a right to. So let's look at human right abuses. Now, human rights abuses have been an integral part of the Indian government's policy in Kashmir for decades. Uh, they think that by oppressing people, um, by killing them, by scaring them, that they will stop uh, people's appetite and passion for independence and self-determination. And if anything, if the fight for freedom and human rights around the world has taught anything in our history, it's that rather than people losing hope, it, it, people's opinions and, and policies and ambition uh, has been strengthened uh, as a result of living under the occupation. Now, according to the United Nations and independent human rights group, 47,455 Kashmiris 
have been killed since October 1989 when the uprising happened. And just to tell you about how much military are there to carry out that occupation and oppression, between 350,000 and 400,000 army and paramilitary forces are, uh, are based in Jammu and Kashmir. And this is a really sad and shocking statistic, but 6,300 women have been raped without any recourse to justice. And you hear about the stories of uh, military uh, personnel and, and the authorities, paramilitaries going into villages and raping women. Um, and very much like in Israel, uh, settlements and pushing in Hindus to Kashmir to actually change the dynamic on the ground, um, change the ethnic and religious makeup of the state of Kashmir. Rape, torture, disappearance are commonplace as are de uh, deaths in custody. And these abuses are part of a wider campaign of intimidation of the Kashmiri people uh, in Indian held Kashmir to stop their passion for independence and freedom. And the Human Rights Watch, which is uh, a reputable human rights organization, uh, documented in 1997 that in Singapore village, occupational forces barged into the house of Abdul Hahad and forcibly took his wife and daughter into a military camp where they were gang raped. And that's the reality of what people are living under uh, in occupied Kashmir. So one of the questions which caused a lot of concern uh, in the Labour Party and political circles here in the UK around the world was, is Kashmir a bilateral issue? You saw that meeting between Prime Minister Imran Khan and President, uh, US President Donald Trump and saying that you know he was prepared to mediate between the two sides. Well, India and Pakistan both say it's a bilateral issue. Um, but why is this so offensive to the Kashmiri people and the cause? Now, Kashmir is on both sides of the border, both in Indian held Kashmir and uh, Azad Jammu Kashmir, believe that it's not a bilateral issue and that they've been ignored. The UN Charter of Human Rights is very clear. People have the right to determine their own future, and a key principle is self determination. So, the reality is, you cannot resolve uh, the issue of Kashmir unless the people of Kashmir are at the heart of that. And those talks won't ever succeed if it's just India talking to Pakistan. Hence why you see the uproar uh, when the new Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, uh, made his comments after his election was announced uh, in April uh, this year. And that's why it caused so much concern amongst many uh, British Kashmiris, but also Kashmiris around the world. So what do Keir Starmer and Keir uh, Labour Party's policy in Kashmir? The Labour Party's policy has been to support UN Security Council resolutions on Kashmir. And you have to remember that many Labour MPs represent constituencies with a high concentration of British Kashmiris. So there's that pressure to make sure that they're advocating for their constituents. And the Labour Party conference uh, in Brighton last year passed a motion supporting self-determination for the Kashmiri people. And one of the uh, things that you have to understand uh, about the shift in the Labour Party policy over these past few months, that it actually didn't start under Sir Keir Starmer. It started under Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, if you remember in the election in November 2019, Labour Party chairman Ian Lavery, uh, he started that shift where he basically started moving away from self-determination for the Kashmiri people and saying it's a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. And that was allegedly after a, a, a big backlash from the British Indian lobby and also supported by the BJP party uh, in India. And Sir Keir Starmer, the, he caused offence. What did he actually say? He said any constitutional issues, this is the changing of the state of Kashmir, are a matter for the Indian parliament. And, any Kash uh, and Kashmir is a bilateral issue for India and Pakistan to resolve peacefully. So just in that quote, you can see there's no mention of the Kashmiri people. There's no mention uh, about self-determination. And that's why it caused huge concern and why it was so offensive to so many people. So let's look at the other political parties. What about the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats? So Boris Johnson, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, during that general election campaign, visited a mosque. He was questioned about his stance and his government stance on Kashmir. And he said, I have deep sympathy with the people of Kashmir and what is happening to them. Uh, but apart from that, uh, apart from those statements, um, not much has happened. But generally, you see that the Conservatives 
have been generally more pro-Indian and have tried to ignore the issue of Kashmir. For example, in your neck of the woods, if you're in London, uh, Bob Blackman, who's the MP for Harrow East, uh, he supported Narinda Modi. He supported taking away the uh, rights of the Kashmiri people and the oppression that they've suffered. And the British government has been very quiet on this, apart from a, a comment uh, that Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, made in the House of Commons, where he condemned uh, the issue of human rights abuses. But apart from that, they've been relatively very quiet. And then you've got the Liberal Democrats under their um, interim leader there, Ad Davies, as you can see in the picture. They've got a very mixed record when it comes to Kashmir. The parliamentarians who, MPs that they used to have in some of those diverse constituencies like Bradford East, uh, Rochdale, um, Birmingham, Bristol, where there is a concentration of British Kashmiris, they were generally a lot more supportive of the Kashmiri cause. But others have remained silent. Uh, you look at uh, Charles Kennedy, Paddy Ashdown, uh, Ming Campbell, Tim Farron, some of these leaders have been very quiet on that. And Nick Clegg, who was the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, he was Deputy Prime Minister, um, he said very quiet. Uh, on speaking of Kashmir, the only time he ever spoke in Kashmir was when he visited the Kashmir reception uh, organised by the Liberal Democrat Friends of Kashmir uh, at party conferences. But generally, when he was in office uh, as Deputy Prime Minister, he was very, very quiet. So let's just look at those UN Security Council resolutions. One of the very first uh, that was that was passed was Resolution 47. Remember, this was at the time India and Pakistan were in a military battle, a war uh, over Kashmir. And what the international community wanted to do is stop the bloodshed, stop the military campaign and have a ceasefire. And as part of that, they passed a resolution stipulating that both India and Pakistan should withdraw their military forces and arrange uh, for a referendum to be held in order to provide the people of Kashmir the choice of which state to join. And you're probably thinking decades later, uh, that resolution hasn't been implemented and no action has been taken against India or Pakistan to make sure that they implement that resolution. And that the world and the international community has stood by and watched uh, numerous decades of human rights abuses by the Indian authorities. And we've also seen numerous uh, United Nations Human Rights Council reports that have highlighted the abuses that have gone on uh, these past few years, but also going back to 1989. And you remember that image of Donald Trump uh, in the White House meeting Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan and offering mediation between the two countries. Uh, that was refused by India on the basis it was a bilateral issue. And what's really worrying uh, in India, that you now have a far-right government uh, of the BJP, which has a huge uh, landslide victory in the last elections uh, and is in their second term. So the chances of mediation, the chances of uh, conversations and um, peace negotiations to try to resolve this issue 70 years on um, is very, very remote. So I just want to talk to you a bit about the special law on Kashmir. If you remember uh, Article 370, which was passed in the aftermath of the partition. And what this allowed was that Kashmir, Jammu Kashmir, which is the Indian held, uh, as we describe as Indian held occupied Kashmir, they allowed the state to have their own devolution, their own power, their own constitution, a separate flag and independence on all matters except foreign affairs, defense and communication. And that worked relatively well, uh, despite the fact there was loads of human rights abuses. There was an idea that uh, it somehow provided real power to the people of Kashmir, but the reality was somewhat different. And then last August, the Modi government revoked that special law, the Article 370, um, and replaced it with federal control from New Delhi so that the, in, the state of Jammu Kashmir no longer exists. It's a, uh, a administrative area which is governed directly from New Delhi and the federal government. At that time in August, it held Kashmiri leaders under house arrest. Many of them are still under house arrest. It banned public gatherings, it restricted internet and phone access, and despite what the news say, uh, those restrictions are still in place nearly a year later. And they then arrested and tortured and held people without any charges in their prisons. And you saw a lot of protests around the world at that change, but also actually, uh, which, which hasn't often happened in India, you saw those protests as well across India in, uh, in opposition to the Modi government. But the sad reality is, in the end, uh, that law passed 
due to the huge majority that uh, BJP had uh, in the Lok Sabha, which is their uh, federal parliament. I just want to finish off, uh, if I may, to talk to you a bit about uh, Narendra Modi and his RSS ideology, this far right extremist ideology, which believes that India is for Hindus and anybody who's from a minority, whether that be Muslims, Christians, um, shouldn't have any rights and they should be bow breathing into uh, you know, following and supporting RSS ideology. And it, it's been around for over a hundred years, and it's also been accused of plotting assassinations, stalking rights among minorities, and acts of terrorism. And you've seen the reality of that in India over these past few years, where people have been lynched, Muslims have been uh, attacked and killed, literally killed in the streets uh, because, uh, because they're Muslim, simply. Um, and also not forgetting that the minority Christian community and their places of worship, the churches, have also been desecrated and they've been attacked and abused. And remember that Mahatma Gandhi was shot in 1948 by an RSS uh, supporter and member. And we've seen all these past few years, mosques being burnt, Muslim homes and businesses attacked, whilst the prime minister and his government have turned a blind eye, where the authorities have actually, you know, turned a blind eye and in some cases have encouraged that violence, um, as we've seen on university campuses in Madarsad and in mosques over the years. So if it's okay with you, Mikdad, I'm going to stop there. I hope that gives you a, a historical context of uh, how the issue of Kashmir uh, began and, and how it is now. Um, I just kind of finish on the fact that my parents uh, come from Azad Kashmir, a city called Mipur. Um, and so obviously this is very much a, a personal issue for me uh, and very passionate about this issue. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Jazakallah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Um, obviously, uh, the issue of Kashmir is something that, that matters a lot to many people um, in, in this country and abroad. Um, let, maybe it's worth, um, can I ask a couple of questions? Can we just have a couple of questions a bit about, about the UK and a number of Kashmiris in the UK and how, you know, where do they come from and mm. when it comes to the UK? So just a bit more about Kashmiris in this country. Yeah, so in terms of ethnic minorities, the largest uh, group amongst ethnic minorities is British Kashmiris, uh, close to 1.2 million Kashmiris who are uh, resident particularly in Birmingham, Manchester, Bradford, Leeds, Halifax, Rochdale, Oldham. Uh, you can see them down south in Slough, in Walthamstow, uh, Leighton, uh, spread out in Bristol as well across the country. And, and there's a small community as well in, in Glasgow um, and a very small uh, handful of few people in Belfast as well. Thank you. Um, let me ask Iqbal Asaria. I'm going to un ask him to unmute and then... Um, he's got a couple questions. One second. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for that uh, very clear explanation of what's happening. Mm, I have two questions. In your last slide, you had four photographs on the top. Can you explain what they show? Uh, so the first one, yeah. So you've got here, you've got um, the uh, RSS people and you can see Narinda Modi um, in the picture as well and it's very much a similar sign the ideology is very much similar to Hitler and the Nazis about dom one ethnic uh, uh, community having dominance uh, over everybody else just and you put it on the screen please oh sorry let me let me let me just get this on the screen sorry um, okay sorry I'm just trying to share my screen once again um, okay, there we are. I don't know if people can see that. And as you can see there, um, so there, so so the first image, as you can see, is uh, Narinda Modi there on the right of the picture, uh, and and these are some of the key leaders of the RSS group. And then you can see the similarity. Um, again, these are not my images; I've taken them from the internet. But you can see the similarities to Adolf Adolf Hitler. Um, and his sig signals and signs. And then actually, you, if, you, if you go in further on the picture, you see the vigilantes who were trained as military people. 
to take on this historical uh, religious war against Muslims and minorities. Um, and these are the people uh, who generally are trained up uh, in violence. And wherever there's violence across India, you will see most of these people uh, involved in that. And then you see at the end, um, you know, the RSS, that's just a picture of our RSS uh, event uh, in New Delhi. So, uh, so Mohammed, just for your information, sure. Um, when we were in Uganda, I mean, this is going back fifty years. Some of our Hindu friends, their, their parents, uh, well, dads especially, used to have this khaki short and stick and go for training. So they were RSS members. So this has been in the making for a long time. It's not new, and it's sort of. Uh, I'm sure Hindu communities here also practice that, and that is what is worrying me. The other thing is that they also use the swastika as one of their symbols. Yeah, So it is, it is a common symbol between Nazis and them. Yeah. Yes, they do. And uh, if you look at the ideology and how you link it back to here, the UK, uh, when the Labour Party took a, a, a principal stance for self-determination for the Kashmiri people, actually the BJP were supporting campaigns against Labour MPs in this country. And encouraging places like uh, you know uh, Bob Blackman and others uh, to get them to win um, by interfering in the democratic process in this country, and it was surprising that there wasn't much, as you saw in America, when allegations of Russia interference. Uh, there was a huge political story, and here in the UK there was no story. But you're absolutely right. This is an ideology um, that has been in the making for over a hundred years, and, and th their aim has been to use Modi as the face to carry out their atrocities and carry out their, implement their ideology of uh, global dominance in terms of their territory in India. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Iqbal Uncle. Um, I'm going to now ask Ahmed, Ahmed, where is he? Where, oh, he's just left, has he left? No, he's there, okay. Please go ahead, Ahmed. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Well, Assalamu Ahmed. Good to hear uh, your voice. Thank you, likewise. Um, you call <clears throat> uh, Kashmir under Indian rule as um, Indian ad administered Kashmir, whilst the Kashmir in Pakistan is Azad Kashmir. Is Kashmir in Pakistan actually uh, independent? So if you look at the uh, the government makeup in Azad Kashmir, it's totally independent. It has its own president, its prime minister, chief justice, a separate legal system. And um, obviously there are links with Pakistan. So uh, if the, you know, if, if the Pakistani military were to leave Pakistan held Kashmir, let's just describe it as that. Um, it wouldn't take, uh, you know, a, a few days for them to occupy Azad Kashmir. And so the security that Pakistan is providing to the Azad Kashmir government. But yeah, um, the government depends on support uh, from Pakistan. So it's very much linked. And, and people do say uh, it's occupied. Some Kashmiris do say that it's occupied. But I actually see Pakistan as a partner uh, and a defender in terms of the security of Azad Kashmir. But generally, the government itself has the autonomy and the power to make decisions themselves and determine their own future. And that's the difference, sorry, Ahmed, with Indian held Kashmir. But there isn't that democracy. There isn't that human rights. And there isn't that freedom. Uh, I go to Pakistan every year. I go to Azad Kashmir every year. Um, you know, you could uh, protest against the government of Azad Kashmir quite openly uh, in those cities, in those uh, territories. You couldn't do that in India. Uh, there's another question I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. When you talked about the uh, initial uh, creation, well, um, how, I mean, when, uh, when Kashmir went to India and when uh, the other side went to Pakistan, um, didn't Nehru in uh, June 1947 said very clearly that uh, it is the people of the, the princely states, you know, the other uh, states, should vote who they want to go with. And it was Jinnah who refused. Surely, if Gina had agreed, maybe both sides of Kashmir would have been in Pakistan today. Yeah, I mean, I'll I leave that to the historians to uh, discover. But I think uh, there was a clear attempt by the British, for example, when they carved out um, when they carved out the territory to the two states, that they they left the Kashmiri issue undecided, uh, and there were other princely states around India that chose to go with India. 
that were also not decided. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, at the end of the day, both sides have to be committed to that process, which is let the Kashmiri people decide their future, they determine their own future. And if they decide to go with India, that's their democratic choice. No, but Jinnah refused to give them that choice. Well, I, I think in negotiations that might have been the case, but if it came to an actual referendum, I'm pretty certain that um, history will prove that they, the, the people of Kashmir would want to, uh, majority of them wanted to actually be independent. They didn't want yeah, to be no, independent. That's not my question. My question is Jinnah yeah. is the one who refused to give the people of Kashmir a right to vote who they should accede to. Yeah, well, I think, I think that is in relation to when the negotiations were happening. Um, I think the idea that if you had a princely, the, 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 the Maharaja signed an agreement with Pakistan to allow that trading to go on. So the idea that, you know, Pakistan didn't want to support the Kashmiri cause, I, I don't think that's true. I mean, there were negotiations and discussions. I mean, history will, uh, will tell you that. And obviously, if you've got better knowledge on that, then uh, I'm happy to uh, take your point. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, a question which come from um, Mariam Asaria. Uh, she asks, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Really interesting and helpful. Are there any hopeful campaigns that are creating any meaningful change within India, uh, like the Shaheen Bagh press protests in response to the CAA? Are they making any real difference? I think, I think there's an uh, up uprising now in India, uh, people who understand that this RSS ideology uh, about dominance is actually going to destroy India's fabric as a democracy. And you've seen uh, the fruits of that where you've seen a number of state elections in which B BJP, uh, the party of uh, Prime Minister Modi and his government, have been defeated. And you're starting to see an uprising there amongst young people who are saying, we don't want to live in a country like that. Yes, he's very popular. Yes, he's got a huge landslide. And it's a long process, but you are beginning to see the fruits of, of people rising up against this government and this ideology. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Manzoor uh, Lalji. Um, in your opinion, what's the role of Israel in India, uh, given the close relationship of Modi and Netanyahu? And also, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think if you look at the pattern, Mikdad, of what's happening now in India, uh, Indian held Kashmir, um, it's very much a similar pattern to what the Israelis did um, in, in their occupation of, of Palestinian land. You remember um, after the Palestinians were expelled, they had a 1967 war in which they occupied the West Bank. And then in, in recent years, you've actually seen those illegal settlements. You've seen Jewish settlements that have been uh, created and supported and encouraged and built by the government there to change the dynamics on the ground. Um, and that's what India wants to do with bringing in Hindus and Sikhs uh, into uh, Jammu Kashmir so that they can change the dynamics of the state. So that when, if it ever came to negotiation, that, that it, would, it would benefit them. And you, you see very much similar, the human rights abuses that you see in Palestine is very much the similar to what you've seen in Indian Hull Kashmir. And I was, in, uh, I was in Gaza in 2013 and 14 in the aftermath of, of Israeli aggression there. And when, when you tell them you're from Kashmir, they, they get really, really uh, strengthened by the fact that the, the cause is the same. They, they, they might be different enemies in terms of Israel and Indian as the occupying forces, but the principle uh, that they are both following, the path which Modi is now following is very much the path which the Israelis have done uh, in Palestine. Uh, following on from that, um, given you, you, you talked about um, India's role in the UK elections in terms of trying to influence the election here, do you think that Israel had a similar role? And what is, do you think they're working together between India and Israel, given Modi and Netanyahu's link, or not? I think we know that the Israeli uh, embassy, for example, if you watch the Al Jazeera reports at the time about the, you know, uh, pressure that Jeremy Corbyn was under, um, you know, that there was that involvement of, of people trying to interfere um, in the Labour Party. And we know an embassy official was expelled uh, from the Israeli uh, diplomatic service. But So that's the evidence. Um, did it succeed? Probably not, because in the end, people were determined, you know, to see expression of standing up against injustice around the world. It's central 
uh, to Labour Party principles, the central trade union movement, um, you know, and, and instead of, yes, you might have seen now a new leader of the Labour Party moving back to the centre, but the sentiment of the people out there is very much in support of Palestine and Kashmir. All right, and um, and w w when it comes to looking at the future and what, what you think is most likely, um, given that right now the direction of travel seems to be very clear when it comes to the Indian side of things and, and the choices made by Modi, what do you think realistically is likely to happen? And what do you think um, that we should be campaigning for and supporting? I think we've got to expose the RSS ideology. I think that's really important on the international stage that this is, you know, this is not something that was dreamt up overnight. This is an ideology which was dominance uh, of Indian society and wants to oppress minority communities. In terms of Kashmir, you've seen it where people are being given citizenship um, you know, and giving uh, residency rights, sorry, not citizenship, residency rights to move to Kashmir and to do business there, to establish themselves and their families so that they change the ethnic makeup uh, of that uh, country. And what, you know, it's been going on for, for decades. I, I never, I never stopped believing um, that one day Kashmir will be free and always campaign on that, always speak and, you know, raise our voices. But we've got to expose the atrocities that they're uh, committing. Um, you know, and hope that uh, over time that, that both sides come to the table along with the Kashmiri people and resolve this one way or the other. Another question that's come through, um, how can the Western media be influenced on this issue? Because it looks like the atrocities are hidden and there's not much media allowed in the area. Um, you talked also about the RSS and their atrocities being exposed. Are there good resources in English which highlight and summarize and, you know, um, in a very clear way what the RSS has historically and currently is doing? And how can we ensure that media in this country reflect and, um, uh, that and, and, and uh, are able to report on that? Um, uh, and adding to that, yeah, uh, noting also that there, there is a media blackout there which makes it even more difficult. Yeah, I think that's the key point. There's deliberate media blackout because they did not want people to know what's going on in Kashmir. Um, you've had parliamentarians whose visas have been rejected because they don't want people into independent uh, human rights monitors have not been allowed into Indian Health Kashmir. And the question that gets asked, but if they've got nothing to hide, then why are they not, um, you know, allowed, uh, allowing people in? Uh, I think, you know, credit to the BBC, for example, they were able to talk to some people uh, on the ground in Kashmir and, and they published that. But the contrast, if you want, Mikdad, you, you see in the media uh, is the blanket coverage that Hong Kong protests were getting around the same time uh, last uh, summer, at the same time as the Indian uh, uh, tried to change the uh, state law. And you look at the contrast, how much resources were being put into giving us that. So, yeah, I think we've got to continue to raise our concerns uh, through the political platform, but actually essential for us to raise our voices through the media to make sure that that voice is amplified and, and you know I, I think part of the problem is obviously the the, the lack of coverage um, from there and the, the lack of courage if you like from some parts of the Indian me media um, who are more interested in saber rattling you know and pumping out their chest and ha you know having fights with Pakistan media and politicians rather than actually saying let's just report the news let's report what's going on thank you um uh uh, Fatima uh, also wants to continue and she asks, well, what about Amnesty International? Are they doing anything? Um, what about other human rights groups like or, or Stop the War? Why don't we see any of those organizations doing that? So um, Amnesty International have been very good. Um, they have documented the atrocities that have happened, you know, up until I think from 1989 onwards. And a Human Rights Watch, as I quoted in, in the... Um, in the presentation and you see many other independent human rights organizations around the world documenting that but and again when we look at the uh, you know the israeli model in terms of oppressing the palestinians it's very much similar in their reaction in how they react to some of these human rights reports and so i'm i'm going to see international be very brave uh, in putting it out there uh, and putting the facts out there as they've documented based on actual testimony and evidence uh, from indian health kashmir 
but uh, you talked about so you stopped the war. Um, no, we haven't. We haven't seen that. Um, I'm, uh, I think there's a conversation to be had with colleagues uh, and friends in Stop the War that um, they um, they choose their battles uh, very carefully uh, based on political reasons, maybe in this country around the world. So if it was a, a war being conducted, uh, an occupation uh, by the United States and the UK and its allies, then we're very vocal and we speak out. But when it's something like this, we're, we're pretty silent. So um, yeah, I, I urge them, I urge everybody around the world to speak up for the Kashmiri cause and the Palestinian cause, because these are two in injustices in the world over the last 70, 80 years that haven't been resolved and people are still being oppressed, still being killed on a daily basis. We see that um, in, in, in Gaza, we see it in, in, in the West Bank as well as to what's happening. And then we've got, uh, you know, we've got Donald Trump in the White House. We've got potential, um, you know, of annexing uh, West, ba West Bank lands that has been happening, um, you know, by the Israeli government that's really causing concern for the Palestinian international community. And then we have a, a, a Modi far-right government uh, that wants to change the dynamics on the ground and is trying to be successful in that. Um, Abu Saud, I think you've got your hand up. I'm not sure if that's intentional. If so, um, please ask your question. Uh, Abu Saud, I'd like to say when uh, two weeks were only given uh, by Mountbatten to pursue uh, 600 odd princely state whether to join Pakistan or India. Uh, the V.S. Menon, the secretary to Vallabhai Patel, no, uh, secretary to Mountbatten, he was allowed to go to see the um, prince of Kashmir, Hari Singh. But when Qadiazam asked Mountbatten, he liked to go and pursue him as well. He was refused on the ground of safety and security that is written as our brother Versi was saying, he did not refuse to go, he was refused by Mountbatten. Second question, the safety of Muslim living in India. We should negotiate in UK behind the door with BJP, friends of BJP that these Muslim is not going to cross the border. They're going to stay, stay in India and they claim to be Indian, very loyal Indian Muslims, and they're going to stay there, there forever. So why there should be more than 500 riots since independence? And recently we have seen as well, because of RSS and whatever, we should negotiate behind the scene saying, brother, these Muslims is your citizen, they're going to remain there and they're contributing already economics of India. RSS have been successful. Uh, they're trying and trying. Congress stopped it after independence. Now Congress has split it in many numbers of party. Now the BJP have sprung up and they're issuing the, the, uh, the policy which was introduced in by 19, 1920 by Mr. Mukherjee and other, and that is carry on. We must negotiate. Internationally, all of us doing a lot better, but as mentioned by many of my friends about Israel, Israel said that when we come, all the negativity about India will be gone. They offered the same thing to Pakistan. If you join open, embassy, all the negativity of Pakistan, international media, that will gone. Pakistan is not ready yet for that. Unfortunately, a lot of Muslim countries have loose connection with Israel. Pakistan is not ready for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abu Saad. Um, Saud, sorry. I mean, the first point, um, I, I think you're right. If you read the history books, um, the, the, they, the British deliberately left the issue of Kashmir and resolve. And the other princely states, uh, as you refer to, there were a number of states um, that weren't under the direct control of the British Empire who were given a choice to choose which way they wanted to go. And it, it was it would have been right and proper for that, for the Maharaja of Kashmir, where there was a majority Muslim population to actually say, well, actually, we, we want to be independent or we want to be 
with Pakistan. So there, there were conversations going on about trade and uh, other agreements, as I said in the presentation, but actually about overall control of the state, um, that didn't happen. And, and I think that was a deliberate attempt by the British to leave this problem unresolved so that those two countries would continue to you know, bicker and fight amongst themselves. And what, what have we learned over 70 years? That's what's happening. Um, in terms of your point around Pakistan and, you know, uh, Israel and uh, all their uh, sort of Muslim countries, I, I think you know, what we've got to do uh, is how can you negotiate with somebody who says that you, you, you're not uh, worthy of being negotiated to, that your life is not worthy, you, you just being attacked and killed because you're a Muslim or you're a Christian, you're a minority. Um, and I think that you, you can't compromise uh, with these people and you cannot negotiate with people who have an ideology, a far right ideology, which is about global dominance of one particular race in their territory. And that's what I, I find difficult to do. What we can do is shine a light on that through the media, through social media. And lots of young people are active uh, in their networks and, you know, uh, holding, a holding a light to what's happening in India. That's really important. Sorry, um, yeah, uh, uh, another question from um, Manzoor. Um, with the recent advances of China in Kashmir and Ladakh, will this have any effect on the um, situation in Kashmir in terms of Indian military presence in the area? Um, no, I think, I, I think there is a, a clear um, strategic role that you see Pakistan and China playing. They're very close partners. You see that, um, you know, CPEC, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, going through Pakistan, China is investing a lot of money in that country. And so, the, yeah, if you look at the 17% the of Kashmir that's under Chinese control, it was given deliberately by the Pakistanis to, you know, to tie in China into this Kashmir problem. Um, and so you, you, you get that uh, the friction, if you like, between the Indians and the Chinese, but they understand that the, that military aggression won't be recognized. And then you saw, I think last year, uh, the, the, the you know Modi government trying to attack um, uh, Azad Kashmir, and their pilots being captured and you know given a cup of tea and sent sent on his way back home. And and so there's there's that sort of battle going on as well. But if you live on the line of control in Azad Kashmir, uh, people are dying on a daily basis because of the shelling from the Indian side, and and that hasn't stopped. Life is still very hard for the people who live on the border. Uh, people are dying on a daily basis from that shelling uh, and, and firing from the military there. Okay, uh, and you, uh, another question from um, Mr. Uh, Nizar Maradi. Um, we're all aware of the Palestinian liberation movement in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, whilst you haven't got massively great tangible results, the movement is very visible. Uh, do you feel the Kashmir liberation movement lacks a similar luster and what can we do to enhance this? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question because you've got uh, the JKLF, which is the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, which is very much about independence and they don't want any association with Pakistan uh, or India um, in Azad Kashmir. So JKLF operate in both Jammu Kashmir, um, uh, standing up against the oppression uh, from the Indians, but also operates in Azad Kashmir and very much about you know, we don't want to be part of Pakistan. And that's been a big struggle because you've got people in Pakistan who say Kashmir, uh, there's a slogan, I, I, I'll explain it uh, in Urdu, um, uh, Kashmir Banega Pakistan. And that's been the slogan which politicians for decades have said, um, Kashmir is going to become Pakistan. And then you've got the Kashmiri people who are saying, wait a minute, we don't want to be Pakistan. We want our right to determine our own future. Uh, and that's causing a, a lot of friction. And if you look at some of the protests that happened last year, you had that tussle. I, I spoke at a couple of events where you had, you know, Pakistanis uh, who think that we should, uh, you know, Kashmiris should be grateful for the fact that we provide, that they're providing shelter. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't criticize the Pakistani military or government. And then you've got other side who said Pakistan is as, as bad as India uh, in its occupation, which is, you know, it's just far-fetched and not based on any truth. So, that, you know, that whilst that movement is there, it's very much fragmented. Um, and if you look at the Palestinian cause, um, you know, you've got groups there operating relatively the same ideology, relatively the same passion, principles and goals. Whereas in Kashmir, it, it's very much divided between those who are pro-Pakistani, those who are pro-Indian and then people in the middle who don't want anything to do with either side. 
Um, thank you very much. Um, oh, does Kashmir need the equivalent of an army stationed at India's border? Well, that's uh, the army already stationed at their border is the Pakistani army. And what I often say to my Kashmiri uh, friends, family and brothers and sisters, when they raise this issue about, um, you know, India, Pakistan should withdraw its forces from Azad Kashmir. Um, if Pakistan withdrew its forces from Azad Kashmir, probably 48 hours it would take for the Indian authorities to occupy Azad Kashmir. And so the army, Pakistan army, is at the forefront at that border, standing up to India and making sure that they don't do anything which damages uh, Azad Kashmir. And I just think sometimes people in Kashmir, as passionate as they are for independence or self-determination, forget that the one security that they've got when the rest of the world has forgot them, the international community is turning a blind eye, is Pakistan and its military, and we should pay tribute to them for that. Um, is, is that military there with the permission of the Kashmiri government? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, successive Kashmiri governments, Azad Kashmir uh, parliaments and assemblies have passed rulings uh, in support of the Pakistani authorities. Um, and they do have lots of control in lots of different areas, which is obviously a bit of a shocker for us. If you imagine um, nationalization of, you know, electricity, gas, um, you know, telecommunication, cement, and all these sort of companies which the army operate, which is normal practice in that part of the world, um, but isn't in this country. And so, yeah, that army is there to protect um, Azad Kashmir's uh, population from the Indian aggression. And India knows that if they try anything stupid, uh, they'll get a fitting response from the Pakistani authorities. And many, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say many, many Pakistani soldiers have given up their life. They've become shaheed. Um, in defense of Azad Kashmir, and we, sh we shouldn't forget that. Final question, I was come through. Uh, what, what is your view of all these people who talk about terrorists in the same way as they talk about Palestinian terrorists and, and the Kashmiri terrorists? How do you see this issue? Well, I think uh, there's two sides to this. One is um, terrorism as a political tool um, is forbidden in Islam, and, and the scholars have been absolutely clear about that. And, you know, um, so if people are carrying out atrocities against innocent people, then that's absolutely totally um, wrong and should be condemned. And we always uh, condemn those atrocities, whether that was in Afghanistan, uh, whether it's in Iraq or whether it's in Kashmir or anywhere else. But there is a legitimate military uh, fight for freedom. And the people of Kashmir have the right to defend their lives, their families, and stand up to that aggression and oppression against the. Um, uh, the occupying force, uh, very much similar to what's happening in Palestine. Um, but yeah, there's a big, uh, as, you, as you well know, Mikdad, uh, being uh, you know, very experienced in the media business, it's about a narrative and it's about trying to make out as if, you know, um, the Israelis, for example, in Gaza, you know, blame the Palestinians. You know, if a child gets killed in a bomb, oh, it's the Palestinians' fault because they don't want to take any responsibility. And that's very much similar uh, in India. So yes, very clear that if you're if if, if Kashmiri separatists uh, and freedom fighters and the organisations that are attacking innocent civilians, then I, I absolutely condemn that. I always have done, always will do. But you know, if they're standing up against that oppression and defending their families and their livelihoods and their communities, then that's their absolute right. You know, fighting for their freedom and justice is uh, is a human right after all. Um, thank you very much. I think we actually will unfortunately have to end there because it's um, Margaret, coming up to Margaret time yeah. right now. Um, thank you so much for, for talking and, and for answering yeah. the many questions that came through afterwards that shows the, the interest on this topic uh, uh, across. Um, thank you to those who have joined the Zoom call and those who have joined on YouTube. Just a reminder um, of the te uh, lecture next week. It's on Islam and Slavery by Professor Clarence Smith. Um, please do join then. And every Sunday we have Tafsir with Sheikh Bahmanpur, and that starts. The, that, that's at 9 a.m. You can find it on. You can join live on the same live live stream on youtubecom TV uh, live We also have a um, uh, virtual Zoom, uh, virtual yoga classes um, every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Please do uh, find out and men, uh, talk to a member of the executive committee if you'd like to find out more. Uh, and our Husseini Madrasa classes are, we're talking about how to best move them forward and talk to Asia or their 
the head or um, other people within the admin team of the madrasa to find out more details. Uh, we are still keeping all of our lectures online uh, for now. Uh, we will keep you in the loop um, as to when or if that will change. But our expectations in the, the short to medium term are still going to retain everything online. And so with that, thank you very much to everyone for joining. Thank you, Muhammad, for for um, thank you. giving us the opportunity to listen and hear uh, your insights. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone else. Thanks, Salaam alaikum.